this little guy is uh, an amazing, amazingly rare bird, this recording right here. And so is what we're going to play it on. Uh, understand that this recording is close to 100 years old, so it's going to sound a little bit scratchy. It's simply listed as uh, Fife Drum and Bugle Corps, On to Victory March. And it's just fascinating uh, to have this because it's the first uh, concert drum corps recording that I could find. You know, years ago, it was possible to go into a record store and go to a certain spot in the record store that said marches or bands or something like that and find 30 or 40 drum corps albums. You know, all these little cores from these little, these little church cores and fire department cores, and their, their albums were right there, right next to Sinatra. They were accessible. This is helping drum corps to be accessible again. big claim to fame was the uh, Imperial Margarine commercial, the one that went da 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 that one. I got that on a referral. The real guy that was supposed to do it didn't feel like doing it. He said, you can handle this. I said, I don't know. It's four notes. I'm an audio producer. I run recording sessions. A producer is to a recording uh, as a director is to a film. The first recording, State of the Art, came about because I was kind of a rookie producer. I had been doing recordings for a couple of years and had grown up in drum corps and was teaching drum corps and writing for drum corps. But anyway, I've always thought that drum corps had the ability to produce sounds that most people never got to hear. Even if you went to the best drum corps show and had the best seat in the house, you didn't hear everything. You heard one aspect of drum corps. But wouldn't it be great if you could stand in the middle of that rehearsal arc? And only a few, chosen few people get to do that. Only the brass instructor, only the percussion arranger get to go inside and hear that thing. Even the performers and the cores don't hear that sound. And yet it is, for my money, the most intense acoustic sound on the planet. There is nothing more intense than that. So that's how the 1981 came about. And uh, it was wildly successful from an artistic point of view. And now, 20 years later, the people who were involved in that were now further on in their career. The two drum majors, for example. Mike Zapanta, an independent filmmaker. David Gibbs, the president of the board of DCI. And yet, they were both on that stage the same afternoon, 20 years before. The people who played in those drum corps had gone on to become judges, arrangers, choreographers, designers, and they were all the lions of the, of the drum corps industry at this point now, 20 years later. So I thought, wouldn't it be fun to put this thing out again, only this time on CD, and annotate this and say, look, now she's doing this and he's doing that and she's doing that. Isn't that cool? Just for fun, to see what, well, it was wildly successful. And so, re-release State of the Art 1. Well, on CD. on CD. Well, as luck would have it, six months later, the Blue Devils and the Vanguard are co-champions of DCI. It's now 20 years later, and I do not need a tank to roll over me. I realize this would be a very good time to do another recording like this. Except now, we have the technology of 20 years in the future compared to the other recording. And now we can make it sound even better. I think that I was so enthusiastic about it that I was scaring people. And so they didn't know what to do with me except say yes. <laughs> so we did it again, only more so. <laughs> Now the ideas are flying like crazy. How do we, you know, how do we do this? Well, clearly we should do it in digital sound as opposed to, to analog. 
And then having said that, well, let's go for the whole cookie. Let's do surround sound as well. Let's put the listener in the fantasy chair, not just in front of the core, but inside the core, inside the circle, completely surrounded by that sound. You know, there's a difference between recording Metallica and Yo-Yo Ma. There's a difference between recording Maynard Ferguson's Big Band and the Chamber Symphony. And that seems like an obvious cliche to say that, but you know, a lot of times people record things the same way. So whereas the basic parameters might be the same, yes, we want to do it in surround sound, yes, we want to do it in multiple microphones, it required that those of us on the tech side of this understand the music. So there was a lot of homework done out in front. I went to rehearsals, I made practice recordings, I got the musical scores, I looked at them, I consulted with the staff, and then I had to translate those thoughts and ideas and whatever to my technical team. And when we finally got everything on tape and when it was time to make the mix, we had to try to bring out some of that. So it's kind of, it's, that's the creative part of being a producer. One of the things we discussed was, where do we do it? Now, I wanted control of the environment. I wanted to do it indoors in the field house. And Dan Atchison, God bless him, in his wisdom, said, no, Frank, do it outside so that people who are interested can go and look at it and watch the process. That gave me a, a chill down my back because I thought, my God, what am I going to do? What if somebody does this? What if they do that? What if they... It didn't happen. People came, they watched the process. It was like watching a film. And as long as we told them what to do, as long as we gave them their cues, you wouldn't even know they were there. Wait until I say, stop tape. Okay, at that point, you can applaud or whatever you like to do. But I need clean fronts and backs to this so we can have a nice studio style recording and you guys can be part of this. So now we have surround sound, multi-track digital. And where are we going to do this surround sound mix down? Well, if the sky's the limit, which is the only way to look at any of these things, if you're going to do something, swing for the fences. You know, I, we don't go for singles. We go for home runs. <laughs> That's the style of drum corps. Drum corps goes for home runs. Drum corps is the art of the obvious. So obviously, if we're going to do this, where do, we, where do we go? We go to George Lucas's Skywalker Ranch to mix something in surround sound because that's where it's being done. I didn't think we had a chance in Hades. Number one, to get in there. Number two, that anybody would pay for it. But you know what happened? I made a couple of phone calls and they said, oh sure, you can have the friends and family rate. So here we are, you and I and Steve Savage and a couple of other folks, uh, you know, Andrew Lee and Scott Gordon, sitting in at the console at Lucas Ranch, listening to this incredible intense sound coming from five places all around us. And who's coming in the door and peeking in the side? All the film guys. Hey, what's that? I haven't heard anything like that around here. What's that? I knew then we had succeeded in taking this to another level. You know, if it is an art, and I believe it is an art, you know, a lot of people think drum corps is a sport. And because there's a competition involved, at, you know, in some aspects of it, it is sport-like in that regard, but it's much more than that. Because it's not just about the sport. Because in a sport, somebody wins, somebody loses. You know, here, everybody can win. You know, there isn't only one successful drum corps and all the rest of them are on the ash heap of history. That's not how it works. There are lots of them that, if you got in the middle of that circle, could give you those thrills and chills. And I'm thinking about it now, and the hair on my neck is standing up. Okay? I can't help it. I can't help it. And I, and I think that's infectious. And I think that you feel it, too, when we talk about this. And I'm telling you right now, you listen to this, you're going to get that feeling. <laughs> you have to. It's impossible not to. You would have to be on Novocaine not to feel that.